Back at the end of 2019, I upgraded to a Fujifilm X-H1 to start shooting all of my YouTube videos with. And now that I've had it for over a year, I feel like I can make a true long-term review of this camera. So let's get to it. First off, I don't take many photos. And when I do, it's usually on 35 millimeter film. So this will be a very video focused review. Jumping right in here, ergonomics on this camera are absolutely fantastic. The grip is nice and deep. The coating is plenty grippy and most of the controls that you'll need are right at hand. Now, whether you're for or against it, Fujifilm uses top mounted dials to control shutter speed and ISO which makes this a two-handed camera no matter how you slice it. I don't mind this in the slightest though, because to me, I found there is no easier or more convenient way to adjust exposure than by twisting a dial. While appearance is subjective, I personally really like the angular, kind of Darth Vader-esque design that Fujifilm went for here. Also, Fuji says the black coating is rated at a hardness of 8H, and while I don't really have a way of verifying this, the camera has made it an entire year without a single scratch, so at the very least, it's pretty durable. Feature-wise, this camera used to be Fuji's top dog back in 2018, so it's definitely not lacking even today. The 3.69 million dot OLED viewfinder is big, bright, and makes nailing focus a breeze thanks to its resolution, which is still higher than most cameras today. The 90 Hz refresh rate is also a nice touch. The same, unfortunately, cannot be said for the LCD screen. While it gets plenty bright and has touch functionality, it's just not very sharp. At 1.04 million dots, the softness isn't caused by a lack of resolution, but rather the first-gen touchscreen digitizer that Fujifilm used. That said, it's not so bad that it's a deal-breaker, it just means I have to lean on focus peaking a bit more than I otherwise would. The X-H1 is also the only X-series camera to date that has a top-mounted LCD screen. This little screen shows info like exposure, what film simulation you're using, shutter speed, video resolution, and more. It's monochrome and super easy to see, even in bright sunlight. And it also has a built-in front light for use at night. And some info, like battery level and memory card space, are displayed even when the camera is turned off. This top screen is honestly one of my favorite things about the camera. Something I have more mixed feelings about is the featherweight shutter release button. It's both a blessing and a curse. It's fantastic for photography and eliminating camera shake in general, but it also has no tactile feedback pretty much at all, which makes me second guess whether I've started recording all the time especially in the winter when wearing gloves. And half pressed to focus requires some serious finger precision. The dampened shutter, on the other hand, is absolutely glorious. It's so quiet and it has such little curtain shake that I can't believe Fujifilm hasn't included it on more cameras. Just the sound alone is awesome. The video on this bad boy tops out at 200 megabits per second in DCI 4K, which is 4096 by 2160 at 24 frames per second with a 1.17 times crop factor in 4K. It can also do slow motion at 1080p and 120 FPS. Personally, I find myself shooting most often in UHD 29.97 frames per second, and while I thought the 4K crop would really bother me, and it still definitely does, but it doesn't quite bother me as much as I expected it to. Newer Fujifilm cameras have eliminated the 4K crop completely, so I expect this to be fixed with the Fujifilm X-H2. Super slow motion does introduce some pretty heavy anti-aliasing, but for YouTube content, I don't feel like it's that big of an issue. If you can't stand it, 1080p60 is also available and doesn't have any of that aliasing. This camera was the first to be able to record into Fuji's F-Log color space internally, and it really does help you get the most out of your footage. Fujifilm also makes a few free LUTs to transform your F-Log footage into the Rec. 709 color space in post-production. The dynamic range on this camera hasn't left me for want at all, and the footage is really sharp in both 4K and 1080p. And of course, I'd be remiss to make a review about a Fujifilm camera, without mentioning Fujifilm's film simulations. 
All the old stalwarts are here, like Provia, Astia, and Velvia, but the X-H1 was the first camera to get Fuji's then latest Eterna film simulation, specifically designed for filmmaking. And I've put Eterna to pretty good use over the past year. It's contrasty enough that you could use it straight out of the camera, it's easier to expose than F-Log, and you get similar dynamic range to F-Log if you set the expanded dynamic range setting to 400%. Log still has its place, but I would wager most people will really like Eterna for video work. The in-body stabilization, or IBIS, was a bit finicky in the beginning, but after a few firmware updates, its performance is now among the best in the industry, and it has successfully managed to curb my gimbal lust, for the time being at least. Video autofocus is limited to face tracking only, but it does work most of the time, I've never had it trip up when there was a face to track, but it does do some hunting on still scenes when there's nothing to follow. That said, it is still miles ahead of Panasonic's latest offering, and it really isn't too terribly far behind the competition. The camera has a microphone jack with a decent, if not outstanding preamp. It's actually what I'm using to record this voiceover with, so you can make your own judgment off of that. If you use the separate weather-sealed VPB-XH1 grip, you'll also get a headphone jack to monitor audio, as well as a separate set of controls for portrait orientation shooting, the ability to use two extra batteries, and the ability to run the camera off an AC adapter. Unfortunately, I almost never use the grip for two reasons. First, the camera stops video recording when it switches from using one battery to another. And second, I've had a plethora of instances where the camera will randomly think the grip has been disconnected, which also stops video recording. I haven't heard of this happening to anyone else, so I may have just got a bummed unit, and I've been meaning to pick up another grip to test this theory, but I haven't got around to it yet. Hopefully, it's just me with this problem. A few miscellaneous items as we close. Battery life is so-so at best. If the grip worked consistently and the camera kept recording as it switched through the batteries, this would be a total non-issue. But since it doesn't, it does leave me looking forward to a Fujifilm X-H2, which will hopefully use Fuji's larger NPW235 batteries. The dual SD card slots are a nice touch, and they do work well on the few times that I've used them, but I rarely use two cards at once. And last but not least, I wish Fujifilm's smartphone app let you transfer raw files wirelessly to your phone for editing in Lightroom Mobile. Price-wise, these cameras go for about 700 bucks on the used market nowadays, which surprisingly is only about $200 less than I paid for the camera a year ago, and it's still not a terrible deal. But it's also only $300 less than what the brand new and more feature-packed Fujifilm X-S10 costs. If those $300 make a major difference to you, or you value durability above all else, the X-H1 is still a fantastic camera that will get you outstanding images and video, and it will continue to be my main camera until the Fujifilm X-H2 comes out, or the Panasonic Lumix S5 line gets phase detect autofocus, whichever comes first. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked the video, hit like, get subscribed, and ring the bell so you get notified when I post new videos. And I will see you guys in the next one.